The next one is going to be from the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center, and Susan Nelson is going to make that presentation. Well, thank you for this opportunity to allow us to participate today as one of the green team members, and we're very excited about being here. Um, just like Peggy, though, unfortunately, many of us have been succumbing to flu out at the visitor center, and in the last week, we we're trying to figure out how to keep the visitor center open with staffing at the front desk. So, anyway, so we're all kind of recovering in different stages of recovering. Um, I was trying to think back on when you all took a walk through the visitor center, and I was, when, was it October last year? <laughs> How time flies. <laughs> um, we have been at this um, and working as a green team on um, sustainability accomplishments, and we compiled a report, and we looked back, and it, we actually started in June of 2001. So we were quite impressed when we, we, we listed um, our accomplishments and um, everything, and where we've come and where, where, we're, where we are now and where we plan to go. And I did bring copies of our green um, accomplishments sheets, and for everyone, if you'd like one, I'll just put it in the back of, of the room. Or if you'd like one as I do the presentation, we can have Mary pass those out. Um, when you walked through the visitor center, many of you folks um, were there and you saw a lot of our accomplishments, um, some of which were replacing a lot of our light bulbs, um, especially just in our store alone. We had uh, 54 um, uh, incandescent bulbs and... Um, when, and we replaced with those compact fluorescents and um, thereby addressing the system condition number one, which is part of the natural step process. Um, and we did list those on, on our sheets, the four different steps. And I've identified all the way through here each step. Um, or each, each system condition that attaches to each of our accomplishments. But, um, and you saw the, in the, all of the bulbs replacement. One thing we also did too is reduce our grass mowing and grooming area. And as you can see from the visitor center and many who've been, uh, who've been out there, we had a lot of um, mowing that we were doing. And with that, um, uh, the use of the two cycle um, uh, lawn and garden equipment um, those engines don't run very efficiently, so they produce the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, and they're less than aromatic. Um, they actually are, are um, caustic uh, pollutants um, that we put out in the environment. And so we ended up looking at our lawn um, mowing and uh, with the goal in mind to cut it down by half. And um, we need the outdoor space because we do a lot in education and um, we have large classroom sizes. When you get 80 to 120 kids out there, they take up a lot of room, <laughs> um, especially when they're doing hands-on learning activities outdoors. Um, we have big events like Kids Fishing Day where we get 300 kids outside. And so, um, and, and that um, we, need to, we do need some areas where we uh, have mowed grass in order to do those activities. Um, but we did uh, actually cut down um, by half. Um, and then we also added in, um, and many have seen the gardens when you've visited there, our native wildflower um, uh, grasses, shrubs, and tree gardens. Um, using all native species um, of the right genotype that are from um, the Lake Superior Clay Plain region. So um, we have added in 20 gardens. Um, we use those for interpretation and education so people can learn about the native um, uh, vegetation, but it also um, gives us an opportunity to cut down more on the mowing too. <laughs> Although that presents uh, an opportunity for more garden maintenance and hands-on fun stuff with kids, um, which is, it was a, a great opportunity. Um, but that, but just by doing and reducing um, our mowing, we address condition one and three and uh, helps push us forward on the natural step process. Um, we've also replaced um, in our observation tower the in incandescent bulbs and um, that has also helped us on our energy um, reduction. Um, we did a, uh, completed a solar assessment um, in summer of last year, and um, 
that assessment was done by Kurt Nelson out of Cornucopia, and um, I do have a copy of that report. Um, we, it appears, though, it, we have a, a lot of um, roof uh, uh, to this building, this 36,000 square foot facility. Um, it doesn't appear that it's all at the right or correct angle for um, putting up solar panels, and um, it would yield very little um, uh, energy uh, from the solar panels. So that didn't look like it would be a very viable option. It would take many, many years to um, uh, receive the benefits of that and pay off the, actually the, the uh, cost um, for the panels it's themselves. Um, so that was one study that we had done, and um, and we, it it actually re would require us to take a further look at um, other options, um, which I'll discuss here in a few minutes. Um, one thing that we did was we posted um, last summer for many of you that were able to come up and see this. Um, it was a exhibition, traveling exhibition that's been all around um, Wisconsin and it's over in the Twin Cities right now at um, a couple of different museum facilities. But this is uh, an exhibit called Paradise Lost and it was actually um, artists and scientists coming together to explore w um, the arts um, through the, the climate change science. And so what culminated in that was uh, an exhibition of artists' work that um, they interpret the science through how the artists view it in the, through their eyes. And so it was an incredible exhibit. And um, we hope to, and we've explored the opportunity of actually trying to bring this exhibit back up north here again, too. So we're, um, we're hopeful that that may happen in, in the future. So um, there was about 70,000 people that visited the, uh, the center last summer that viewed this exhibit so, and, and um, left comments and a lot of comments uh, for us both in our register and at the front desk personally to um, our staff. And so that was, uh, we feel, was, was very effective. It's hard to measure sometimes um, without exit interviews and things how effective you are with your interpretation and education, but um, just with our staff interactions and, and the comments that were left for us, the written comments, uh, they were very favorable and open to um, uh, climate change issues and wanting to know more. Um, Another accomplishment um, that we began um, last fall was we received funding through the um, U.S. Forest Service to begin a um, three-quarter acre plot for a native seed orchard. And um, what we're hoping to accomplish with that is work with um, various native plant growers in, in nurseries in the area to actually use um, seed collected from various sources such as um, the uh, U U.S. Forest Service, Shawamaga, Nicolay National Forest locally, and then also the Whittlesea Creek National Wildlife Refuge to um, get native uh, forbs, uh, grasses, shrubs, and trees, and actually propagate them ourselves um, at, on our seed orchard. We had a um, very um, a slow start. Um, we started with a, a an crop of winter rye, which you see there sprouting to the left in the picture. Um, winter rye is, has allelopathic properties, so um, it actually will help us in um, killing out the non-native seed source, um, which um, pervaded us um, in that open field. Um, we had reed canary grass growing, and, so, and reed canary grass is very invasive, non-native European species. So we were trying to eliminate that seed source, and we will have to do another crop of winter rye this coming spring, and then till it up, and then put a cover crop to recharge the soil in the summer. So um, this year we'll be mostly um, doing crops, and then we'll finally be able to plant seeds um, and other um, rootstock in this next fall. So that's some, something that we've, we're really looking forward to. Um, something that we've done is doing a lot of plantings of trees. Um, we work with school groups out on our 180-acre um, visitor center site. And you can see a little tree seedling, a little hemlock seed, seedling up there in the upper right-hand corner. Um, we plant 
hundreds, if not a thousand or so trees um, each year, just trying to um, revegetate that old farm field, which we uh, um, we purchased as part of the visitor center property. Um, so that's a very time-consuming project. Um, we did um, or completed um, a wind power or uh, wind assessment, and um, our Forest Service engineer staff and um, our center director, Steve Hecker, um, were largely consumed with this um, study. And it looks like at this point that um, we're going to be in the wind power business because that would be something that would, would be would yield um, um, the power that we need in order to hopefully um, become zero net energy facility. And um, that wind assessment, and I do have copies of it, and I can put them in the back if you'd like to see them. They're um, done by Focus on Energy. But um, this, there's different windmill options um, that we can uh, choose from, and our engineers actually are um, have actually decided on a couple of different models that they'd like to um, research a little bit further um, for suitability on our particular site with the uh, amount of um, wind and the wind direction that we have on the site. Um, we have northwest prevailing winds, but there's a lot of open area, so we do have that whole farm field where the wind just comes. It can be flat calm out in the bay, and we have wind at the visitor center site. It's just really amazing. <laughs> um, the tower itself would be about 150 feet high. And um, that will be very noticeable on the landscape. Um, if you're coming down Highway 13 from the north and to the intersection of US Highway 2, it's going to stand up above the tree line, definitely. Uh, the tree line is up 50 to 60 feet or so, so this is going to stand up well over that 100 so feet over that tree line. So it should be pretty interesting. Our Forest Service engineers were here about a week ago. And um, they were here taking pictures on if you were eastbound or westbound on US Highway 2, um, what would it look like if you were traveling up and over that knob from um, the UW Extension Station where you come down from the west side on US Highway 2 and you're, you're approaching the visitor center? What's that going to look when you come up and over that highway? And then it's like, whoa, there's this huge thing up and over the trees. <laughs> so, and um, they uh, also um, made a determination while they were here um, to the exact location um, where this this tower would be located and um, if you've been out to the visitor center you know that we go way back to the Stephenson farm on a property there and the front front half of the visitor center property is within the landing area for the Ashland airport and so we had to stay clear of that you can't have a 150 foot obstruction in the way for landing <laughs> or aircraft. So um, it would be located on the back side of the property between the visitor center and Terwilliger Road. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a map here, but I can show you. It's, it shows you that in our energy plan, so you can take a look, um, our wind assessment plan, so you can take a look at that if you'd like. But um, our engineers are trying to figure out what that's going to look like. And one of the things that um, we're required to do um, is, uh, w according to the National Environmental Policy Act, is to do an environmental assessment for any long-term effects to the environment. So that's one thing that we're going to be consumed with this entire year is, is, um, is reporting out on that. There will um, actually be public scoping that will be done, a 30-day comment period, so you'll be able to interact with us and let us know what you think of that 150-foot tower that's going to be out there. But um, we expect, though, that it's going to yield quite a, um, enough power to be able to make us a net zero facility. So that's pretty exciting. Um, one thing that the USDA requires of um, any of the USDA agencies is to do an environmental footprint survey. And so that was something our engineers did this past year, and that was to look at um, our 
uh, energy use, water use, fleet and transportation, waste prevention and recycling, green purchasing and um, sustainable leadership. And then what happens um, with this is all this data is input for um, our facility to determine what our footprint is and that goes up um, all the way up to Washington DC and it gets put into a uh, Office of Management and Budget Environmental Stewardship reports. Um, the federal government is, as a whole is one of the largest consumers of goods, services, and energy in the United States. And so um, by changing our habits, we can really have an effect on what, uh, you know, and, and demonstrate what the government is doing throughout our nation so that this is uh, fairly significant. All agencies are going to be doing this. This is just something that the USDA required us to do for our facility. So um, you can actually go to www.ofee.com gov and then look at some of the sustainable operation successes um, for the federal government so if you're interested in that you can check that out online Another thing that we did was um, we participate in the Secure the Call Foundation um, by recycling our uh, phones. One of our front desk staff thought of this idea, and a lot of people are just, what are, what are we doing with these cell phones, just throwing them away? <laughs> and um, there's a lot of people um, that could use those phones. Um, uh, shelters um, and other organizations, nonprofit organizations that maybe don't have a, a capability of having a cell phone, they don't have enough financial resources. Um, and these, call, these phones can actually be used for 911 emergencies. You can make a free call. So by giving them to abuse centers or women's shelters or whatever, um, what we've done is set up a station at our front desk. People can drop by the visitor center and just drop off their phone if they want to get a brand new phone and then give it to a good call. So we thought that was something really good for the community, um, good for our citizens um, of the Shawamigan Bay region. Another thing that we're working on with our Forest Service architects and engineers is a LEED certification. And um, this is a leadership in energy and environmental design. We have an existing building, so it's not like we're a brand new facility where we can um, start construction with recycled materials and um, actually um, reduce waste by recycling our waste materials to other sites that may need it or other industries, but um, we um, I don't have that option, so we're considered an, an existing facility, and um, we're working with our Forest Service architect to actually get that LEED uh, certification this year. It's quite a process to go through, um, and our architect has 20 days of, of um, time uh, just devoted to uh, getting that LEED certification um, and working with our center staff. So that's something that's on this year's work plan, and I just don't know enough about it to be able to tell you uh, how it's going. <laughs> I wish I did. Um, let's see, another thing that we're doing is um, uh, vermicompost. We're going to be in the worm business this year. <laughs> and these worms are really hungry and they reproduce very fast. Um, you can start out with a couple hundred worms and have a, a thousand worms in, in, in a couple of months. So, <laughs> and they're very hungry. And these, um, we have a lot of groups that come to the visitor center using our facilities and our kitchen facilities and leaving behind um, what we would cons consider a compost or food wastes. And so even coffee grounds, eggshells, everything, uh, phone books, if they're printed as soy base, uh, those hungry little red worms will eat it all. So we have chosen a system, it's a tray system where you in input, air, air flows through that, but you have the the worms, um, they're digesting things as you input on the top and the worms are working their way through the material and by the time you get out to the bottom, that's the stuff that I'm really going to be looking forward to, to putting out in the native gardens, which is the compost material. That's actually soil. So the worms will be making our, our, our soil and I'll have very enriched fertilized soil to put out um, in, into our gardens. And then also for Kids Fishing Day event, um, I guess those red worms are really popular with fish too. So we're looking forward to that. And dreaming big. Um, the last thing I wanted to say is that we have um, submitted a proposal for the U.S. Forest Service for $1.96 million for our capital improvement um, 
uh, program, and that's to convert the center to a zero net energy facility using the wind and geothermal power. Um, so that's pretty exciting, and if we're funded for that, we do all our environmental assessment work this year, um, we could have that wind tower out there, plus using the pond out back for geothermal, and that's what it would look like if you look at the lower graphic there, because we'd be using that cold um, spring pond out back, which where we have it stocked with trout, trout for kids' fishing day, but and other th activities, but um, we would be using that and, and recycling that through the facility. So we actually have plans our engineers have, have um, uh, uh, designed to um, actually do something like what you see right there. So, and that's what a tower would look like. That picture is one of the towers um, up above on a school ground, and that's what our, our tower would look similar to that. And you can see the scale with the people in the, in the underneath. <laughs> So that's it for the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center. Thank you. I remember when the Northern Great Lakes Visitor Center opened, everybody said this is going to be impossible with all these state and federal agencies trying to work together with their different guidelines. To me, it, their organization, their team has been a model. They have met regularly outside of our gatherings to, to come up with these ideas and to communicate them. And the uh, idea of using their facility, for example, for um, in terms of uh, people bringing in their cell phones, we've talked about this in other team meetings that we've had. I know we talked about the possibility of Walmart trucks if they're leaving our area empty. Is there something that we can put in those trucks, you know, to take back somewhere for recycling, something that currently isn't recycled. So that's another idea. 